Was it a dream? God, ma passò. I loved her madly. Why does one love? Why does one love? How queer it is to see only one being in the world, to have only one thought in one's mind, only one desire in the heart, and only one name on the lips, a name which comes up continually, rising like the water in a spring, from the depths of the soul to the lips, a name which one repeats over and over again, which one whispers ceaselessly, everywhere, like a prayer. I'm going to tell you our story. For love has only one, which is always the same. I met her and lived on her tenderness, on her caresses, in her arms, in her dresses, on her words, so completely wrapped up, bound and absorbed in everything which came from her that I no longer cared whether it was day or night, or whether I was dead or alive, on this old earth of ours. And then she died. How? I do not know. I no longer know anything. But one evening she came home wet, for it was raining heavily. And the next day she coughed, and she coughed for about a week and took to her bed. What happened I do not remember now. But doctors came, wrote, and went away. Medicines were brought, and some woman made her drink them. Her hands were hot, her forehead was burning, and her eyes were bright and sad. When I spoke to her she answered me, but I do not remember what we said. I have forgotten everything, everything, everything. She died, and I very well remember her slight, feeble sigh. The nurse said, ah, and I understood. I, I understood. I knew nothing more, nothing. I saw a priest who said, your mistress, and it seemed to me as if he were insulting her, as she was dead. Nobody had the right to say that any longer, and I turned to him out. Another came, who was very kind and tender, and I shed tears when he spoke to me about her. They consulted me about the funeral, but I do not remember anything they said, though I recollect the coffin and the sound of the hammer when they nailed her down in it. Oh, God, God, God. She was buried. Buried. She did that hole. Some people came, female friends. I made my escape and ran away. I ran and then walked through the streets, went home, and the next day started on a journey. Yesterday I returned to Buddy, and when I saw my room again, our room, our bed, our furniture, everything that remains of the life of a human being after death, I was seized by such a violent attack of fresh grief that I felt like opening a window and throwing myself out into the street. I could not remain any longer among these things, between these walls which had enclosed and sheltered her, which retained a thousand atoms of her, of her skin, of her breath, in their imperceptible crevices. I took up my hat to make my escape, and just as I reached the door I passed the large glass in the hall, which she had put there so that she might look at herself every day from head to foot as we went out, to see if her toilet looked well and was correct and pretty, from her little boots to her bonnet. I stopped short in front of that looking glass in which she had so often been reflected, so often, so often, that it must have been retained in her reflection. I was standing there, trembling with my eyes fixed on the glass, on that flat, profound, empty glass which had contained her entirely, and I possessed her as much as I, as my passionate looks had. I felt as if I loved that glass. I touched it. It was cold, oh, the recollection, sorrowful mirror, burning mirror, horrible mirror to make men suffer such torments. Happy is the man whose heart forgets everything that it has contained, everything that has passed before it, everything that has looked at itself in it or has been reflected in its affection, in its love, how I suffer. I went out without knowing it, without wishing it, and toward the cemetery. I found her simple grave, a white marble cross with these few words. She loved, was loved, and died. She is there below, decayed. How horrible. I sobbed with my forehead on the ground, and I stopped there for a long time, a long time. Then I saw that it was getting dark, and a strange, mad wish, the wish of a despairing lover, seized me. I wished to pass the night, the last night, in weeping on her grave, but I should be seen and driven out. How was I to manage? I was cunning and got up and began to roam about in the city of the dead. I walked and walked. How small the city is in comparison with the other, the city in which we live. 
And yet how much more numerous the dead are than the living. We need high houses, wide streets, and much room for the four generations which see the daylight at the same time, drink water from the spring and wine from the vines, and eat bread from the plains. And for all the generations of the dead, for all that ladder of humanity that has descended down to us, there is scarcely anything. Scarcely anything. The earth takes them back, and oblivion effaces them. Adieu. At the end of the cemetery, I suddenly perceived that I was in its oldest part where those who had been dead a long time are mingling with the soil, where the crosses themselves are decayed, where possibly newcomers will be put tomorrow. It is full of untended roses of strong and dark cypress trees, a sad and beautiful garden nourished on human flesh. I was alone, perfectly alone. So I crouched under a green tree and hid myself there, completely amid the thick and somber branches. I waited, clinging to the trunk as a shipwrecked man does to a plank. When it was quite dark, I left my refuge and began to walk softly, slowly, and audibly through that crowd full of dead people. I wandered about for a long time, but could not find her tomb again. I went on with extended arms, knocking against the tombs with my hands, my feet, my knees, my chest, even with my head, without being able to find her. I crept about like a blind man seeking his way. I felt the stones, the crosses, the iron railings, the metal wreaths, and the wreaths of faded flowers. I read the names with my fingers by passing them over the letters. What a night, what a night, I could not find her again. There was no moon, and what a night. I was frightened, horribly frightened, in those narrow paths between two rows of graves. 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 Nothing but graves on my right, on my left, in front of me, around me, everywhere there were graves. I sat down on one of them, for I could not walk any longer. My knees were so weak, I could hear my heart beat, and I heard something else as well. What? A confused, nameless noise. Was the noise my head? In the impenetrable night, or beneath the mysterious earth, the earth sown with human corpses. I looked all around me, but I cannot see how long I remained there. I was paralyzed with terror, cold with fright, ready to shout out, ready to die. Suddenly it seemed to me that the slab of marble on which I was sitting was moving. Certainly it was moving as if it were being raised. With a bound I sprang onto the neighboring tomb, and I saw, yes, I distinctly saw the stone, which I had just quitted, rise upright. Then the dead person appeared, a naked skeleton, pushing the stone back with its bent back. I saw it quite clearly, although the night was so dark. On the cross I could read, Here lies Jacques Olivant, who died at the age of fifty-one. He loved his family, he was kind and honorable, and died in the grace of the Lord. The dead man also read what was inscribed on the tombstone. Then he picked up a stone off the path, a little pointed stone, and began to scrape the letters carefully. He slowly effaced them, and with the hollows of his eyes he looked at the place where they had been engraved. Then, with the tip of the bone that had been his forefinger, he wrote in luminous letters like those lines which boys trace on walls with the tip of a lucifer match. Here reposes Jacques Olivant, who died at the age of fifty-one. He hastened his father's death by his unkindness, as he wished to inherit his fortune. He tortured his wife, tormented his children, deceived his neighbors, robbed everyone he could, and died wretched. When he had finished writing, the dead man stood motionless, looking at his work. On turning around, I saw that all the graves were opened, that all the dead bodies had emerged from them, and that all had effaced the lines inscribed on the gravestones by their relations, substituting the truth instead. And I saw that all had been the tormentors of their neighbors. Malicious, dishonest, hypocrites, liars, rogues, calumniators, envious. And they had stolen, deceived, performed every disgraceful, every abominable action. These good fathers, these faithful wives, these devoted sons, these chaste daughters, these honest tradesmen, these men and women who were called irreproachable. They were all writing at the same time on the threshold of their eternal abode. The truth, the terrible and the holy truth, of which everybody was ignorant, 
or pretended to be ignorant while they were alive. I thought that she also must have written something on her tombstone, and now, running without any fear among the half-opened coffins, among the corpses and skeletons, I went toward her, sure that I should find her immediately. I recognized her at once, without seeing her face, which was covered by the winding sheet, and on the marble cross, where, shortly before, I had read, she loved, was loved, and died. I now saw... Having gone out in the rain one day in order to deceive her lover, she caught cold and died. It appears that they found me at daybreak, lying on the grave unconscious. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. This has been Papa Redwood. Stay warm, live well, and leave a pretty tombstone behind. Go out and enjoy some R&R. &R.